Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode, I think you're going to find it fascinating. We're going to take a bit of a deeper look at modernism and we're going to be looking at it as sort of the, the whole movement which encompasses all the arts including literature and we're going to talk about art itself, then we're going to talk about architecture and then we're going to move on finally to literature. Um, and I think, you know, if you haven't got time to watch it now, save this and come back to it, or put the kettle on, get yourself a drink, and sit back and enjoy this discussion of a movement, because once you understand it, it sort of helps you to slot, particularly because we're about the classics in literature on this channel, helps you to start identifying um, modernist works, modernism in, in works. So, without further ado, let's dig in, shall we? So the first thing to say when we're talking about any kind of movement is you can't exactly pigeonhole everything and say this belongs to this movement precisely. Because art is the inner expression of human understanding um, and it comes along with its own philosophies and ideas and of course everyone, every individual mind expresses that slightly different. Art is also part of a cultural context, it doesn't stand in a vacuum. And so what you'll find with works, you can say they're a modernist work or sometimes you'll hear something like it's a precursor to realism or whatever it may be, because you can't, like I say, absolutely definitively nail something down into one category. And that's why if you're ever trying to work out a piece of literature, is it realist, is it modernist, is it postmodernist, is it this, is it that, you'll, some, you'll frequently think, well, it seems to fit this, but it also seems to fit that as well. So which one is it? I don't understand. That's normal. You can't, you can't pigeonhole absolutely everything. And movements don't have a set starting point. They can be talked of in terms of an age group where you can sort of see the development and then the dying out. But you can't actually say anything before 1870 is, you know, not modern kind of thing. Because there'll be elements of a way of thinking that are developing with people. Because time and society is always moving. Having said that, Movements get their names because there are certain underpinning ideas or recurrent themes that tend to come through. And you'll find a lot in movements know each other and are influenced by each other's works, whether they like each other or dislike each other, or are politely hostile <laughs> to each other, which is a common theme amongst artists. So, what are these common denominators, these recurrent ideas, that scholars sort of define modernism by. Well, we're going to talk about a couple of them and then we're going to look at examples of where you can see that being expressed in the arts. So one of the things that defines modernism or is a theme within the modernist movement is a break from history and a break from tradition. Now, this doesn't just snap in one particular year. People question traditions, people question ideas, but they're so strongly held by society that you can't necessarily push against them outright. But as the ideas begin to break through, as people see changes in society, they see problems with society and hence a need to change, the arts tend to reflect that and it gradually grows until you get a very clear distinction between, wow, people think like this now, there's some traditions that were back then which are just completely flat out refused now. And so you see how a, a movement like modernism, like realism, will grow gradually and then take on a stronger, it becomes sort of the governing idea for a, a length of time. So breaking with history and breaking with tradition, you begin to see this. For me, you start seeing this around the 1860s. Of course, you'll have it just before as well. Um, but the reason for this is up until that point, and again, I'm talking in broad brushstrokes, people used to define what is good, what is art, what is acceptable, what is refined, what is praiseworthy, by looking to the past. Now, just think, for example, of the phrase classical architecture. 
or classical drawing, painting. What are they focusing on here? It harkens right back to the Greeks and the Romans, classical literature, its antiquity. But what was sort of experimented on or investigated more deeply in the Renaissance period, so we're starting the 1700s, I mean the 1600s, uh, the 1500s, 1600s, there was a looking back towards, in the Enlightenment particularly, the study of the Greeks' way of doing literature. They had a way of setting out and analysing and, and sort of consolidating ideas into categories. The formal um, arrangement of logic, what beauty actually is, and then looking at the form of the human body and looking for ideals and perfect representations. One of the things that comes from studying classical uh, works is the idea of aesthetics, what exactly beauty is. And, and one of the most common ideas to, to really sort of lay it in very simple terms, you think of Plato, he basically says art is the, uh, the representation of nature in its most perfect form, essentially speaking. And so that governs the art and architecture. You think, you go back to the old style buildings, you look at Paris right now, for instance, as a, an example of an old style, um, and even in the Napoleonic style, what does it harken back to? What do the capital building in America Okay, the design of it with its columns, what's it harkening back to? Look at the museum, say the British Museum in London, what kind of structure? It's harkening back to the Greeks. You think of the Ionic and the Corinthian pillars. You think of all of the gods that are carved in. Okay, those stone reliefs that are put in there. There is an ornamentation that belongs to what is aesthetically pleasing. And sure, the Greeks and Romans did get a very pleasing look and it's been replicated and the Enlightenment particularly took hold of that because they were interested in form, in a strict defining of form. Now on top of that you've also got historical, cultural and religious attitudes which are correct. This is right, this is wrong. The, the societal system, whether it's a caste system or whether it's upper class and lower class aristocracy and pauper, you know, there was no mobility for a long time. You were born of noble blood. You couldn't just become noble. In fact, during the Middle Ages, you know, you could be killed, put to death, if you pretended to be a knight and you weren't actually of noble stock. You see, there was a very distant break. Things began to change, you know, through the time period. So you start in the 17th century, especially the merchant class. Things begin to alter, but still there is are very distinct. These are aristocratic people, these are lower. Of course, that crashes with the French Revolution, particularly uh, in the 18th century. Um, it happened a century before for the British with the Civil War there. But nonetheless, there were certain ways of living. There's also, you know, you couldn't be an atheist, really. I mean, you could be, but you were really shocking and appalling to society, okay? Because you had to abide by religious mores. There's a right way of doing things. There's a right etiquette. You know, everything has been defined. Modernism casts that off. It starts looking at it and seeing it as restrictive. And the reason for that is it is a, a mind, a philosophical altering and a cultural altering. One of the reasons, and you start getting this um, in paintings, probably a little bit before literature, it's because there's a questioning of the old way of doing things. For instance, the old way of lords running the country and only being an MP if you are a landed, gentrified person, that you belong to the sort of aristocracy. This had caused endless trouble, endless pain. I mean, the French saw that in the French Revolution. And so there's a questioning as to whether that's right and a slow altering. One of the ways that's expressed in literature is an examination of the poorer classes. So you think of Dickens. Now Dickens is not a modernist, but you see this slight altering of where to look for for your stories. Because before that, you nearly always looked at sort of the, what, what, um, or what's the critic's name? I can't remember now, but he calls it high mimetic, Northrop Fry. High mimetic, you know, it's 
it's ordinary people, but they're in higher parts of society, clergy and above kind of thing. And then Dickens starts looking at the common person. And yet before him, Jane Austen, where does she look? She looks at the lower upper, upper class, doesn't she? So there's a moving because certain traditions have not worked. And so there's an adjustment. And those artists tend to be those who really think about the human condition and watch society changing. There's also ideas, particularly around painting and sculpting, of what perfect form is. And that starts to get challenged. And this is another aspect of modernism. It's a break away from the, the usual way of doing things, traditional way. But it starts focusing on an alteration, it starts focusing on technique as well. So there is a, a sort of a fixation towards technique and art for art's sake, not necessarily representational, but exploratory. Now, one of the most famous works of art that really kicks this off is by the grandfather of Impressionism, which is Edouard Manet. And this is in sort of, I think it's 1867 sort of time. And excuse my French, um, it's <laughs> it, the, the picture itself, and I won't put it on screen because I don't know Google, uh, YouTube's policy for this kind of picture, but it's called Le Dujeuner sur le herb, le herb? <laughs> something like that, sounds like le herb, and basically what it depicts is a nude, which, you know, that had gone on before because the, the human form was something to study, but nearly always, well, I'll come to this in a minute, it's a nude, it's a woman, and she's sat at a picnic and she's looking directly at the viewer. But with her are sat two men in full attire. So she's nude, but they're also in, like, common daily attire. I don't mean ragged, they're in suits and top hats. Also, to the side, the sort of the picnic itself, which is very much like a still life. But here we've got the nudes, and we've got, portrait with the men. In the background, it's painted in a sort of landscape effect in the background, which again is a different style of painting, and these are normally kept as distinct categories, still life, uh, portraiture, and landscape. And on top of that, in the background, there is a, a sort of semi-unclothed character bathing, and you don't spot it at first, um, it had to be brought to my attention because I'm no art critic, but she's out of perspective. She's too large for where she is in the picture. She should be smaller than she is. And so all that this is doing, if you look at it, you'll think, oh, it's just a painting. There's nothing extreme about it, like Picasso and his cubism. But actually, it's quite avant-garde because Manet is doing some unusual things. Now, particularly challenging and objectionable for the time, 1860. You imagine being a Victorian in England seeing this painting. In fact, you wouldn't have until the 1870s. You have a nude sat with two ordinary men who are clothed. You know, it's a bit scandalous. And the reason being, nudes have been drawn before, but there was a separation of nudity from everyday life. Most of the nudes you're going to see in the past are imitations of Greek mythology, a re-representation of biblical scenes, and by separating it from daily life, it's not as crass to the sentiments of the times. Whereas what Edouard Manet has done is he's gone and inserted a nude with two ordinary men. This is shocking. Let's think of some other pieces of art, and I'll put them on the screen as well. How about Impressionism? On the screen now, you're seeing um, one of Claude Monet's works. Now, Monet sort of influenced by Manet. And what Monet's doing in this is he's expressing what he sees in life rather than doing a, an exact representation of nature, which is what classical ideas of what art and aesthetics is. Now, this picture in particular is called uh, Impression Sunrise. And critics mocked it because it didn't follow the correct forms. More interested, Manet's interested in light and in technique, and it almost shimmers. Notice it's a pale sort of set of colours. It's not very, very bright. And art critics decided to mock this style of painting by calling it Impressionist. 
You know, it's an impression of a painting. It's not a true piece of art. And they get the word from its title, Impression Sunrise. Now, that's just one example. And you think of the Impressionists, they start stepping away from this constant representation accurately of nature, of the perfect form of angles and dividing the palette. Um, the way they mix their paint is not necessarily down here, but direct onto the canvas itself. Now, modernism, you can find it expressed in different forms of art. So you have Impressionism for a start, and there gets a bit of a movement with Impressionism. Sometimes, up to this point, classically, what colours make shade? Grey, black, browns. But in Impressionism, you start finding blues. You start finding yellows to accentuate shades. Colour starts to be used for colour's sake. You see, it's, exper it's experimenting. It's looking for a new way to describe the world. And part of this comes because of the industrial change. People are moving from the countryside to cities. Things are sped up. Progress is happening. And yet at the same time, it's affecting people badly. But things are massively changing. And so there's an idea which births modernism as the whole movement that other things need to change with it. We need to cast off the old world. So some of the movements in art that you'll get, so we mentioned Impressionism, you'll also get Dadaism, you'll get uh, Falvism. So Matisse, sort of the, the, the forerunner of Falvism, it's a very short period of art history um, at the early part of the 20th century. And this really is part of Expressionist painting because it uses colour for colour's sake. You look at some of Matisse's work, like uh, the one about the musicians or playing music, um, and then there's the other one, is it his study in red? This is, the, everything about this sort of casts off the traditional way of doing things. It's almost like Matisse went out of his way to break the rules. You know, senses of proportion, balances of the colour palette. All of that is thrown away. And yet, it's quite liberating. It's allows people to express what they feel, what it's like to be in the world, rather than an exact representation of the world. Now, this idea of just now using technique, a focus on technique rather than representation, about perspective rather than realism, finds also an outlet in some extraordinary movements, which are all part of modernism. Cubism, of which, you know, Picasso is, is the most famous, isn't it? And then there's, there's Braque as well. Put some of their pictures on screen. Well, look, look at that. You know, it doesn't follow any of the forms at all. And yet there's something very, very evocative about it. You know, this one, Guernica by um, Picasso, it's all ruptured and broke. But it's, a, it's that plea against war. It's an anti-war painting. You know, you've got a gored horse in here. You've got screaming women. You've got a dismembered soldier. There's flames and the, there's this random head of a bull, which puts a sort of that, that Spanish feel into it. So it's so disparate. Notice also the colours. Black and white. It's throwing away the old colours. It's doing the opposite of what Matisse did, which was hugely colourful, overly colourful. Also, focusing on texture comes in in the modernist movement amongst, like, the Impressionists. You think of Van Gogh or Van Gogh, depending on how you want to say it. His, you know, you see the paint marks on there. It's also slightly abstract. You know what his pictures are, but it, again, it's that impression rather than representation. And then you get to the point of surrealism with Salvador Dali. Um, Dali's works... Often some strangely dark themes. The one now the picture I put on screen here is is the one about Narcissus. I think it's called the Birth of Narcissus. And to start with, it's a bit disorienting the the way this is all set up. It's hard to know what's going on. But you'll see that the rocks sort of design on the left. That's the story of Narcissus when the gods let him see his reflection in the lake, and he falls in love with himself, becomes condemned. And then there's the part of the story, the hand holding the egg, you can see that. And coming out of the egg is the Narcissus flower, which is what the gods immortalised him in, the Narcissus flower. If you look right in the background, on the right, you'll actually see the original Narcissus. 
Uh, it's a, that little Greek pose that's going on. So this is surreal. This is trying to explore ideas through art. Cubism allowed you, by the way, to, you know, when you paint something realistically, you can only see it from one perspective, the artist's perspective. But what Picasso starts doing, and the Cubists, is they start, like with analytical cubism, they start looking around multiple parts of scenes and images and objects, and then they paint multiple parts together to get an overall view of everything. And that's cubism, but it doesn't look like that in real life. That is sort of how art, that's how you find modernism. Do you see how it's casting off classical? It's casting off history. It's casting off representation. It's casting off pure aesthetics, almost art for art's sake, it's colour for colour's sake, it's technique for technique's sake. It's a real breakaway. It's time for the world to move on. We've been shackled to this long enough, it's time to progress and move, move with the times, this industrial time, with a lot of philosophers. You know, you think of Karl Marx's socialism, Darwin's natural selection, which is challenging religion at the time. There's an awful lot going on. And so it starts finding itself represented culturally through the artist, and in this particular case, the art, as in painting itself. Now we just have a, a little touch on architecture. So architecture, I find fascinating. I think most of us, if you're into reading literature, you tend to be someone that appreciates the arts. Architecture sort of evokes a story, doesn't it? You, you walk around these great cities and, and the buildings, capture ideas, they capture a sensation, a feeling, a cultural, sometimes a cultural milieu, sometimes a cultural epoch, um, just something that reflects people's view of beauty or, or design or utility if necessary. Again, in um, architecture, there are forms, okay, I'm no professional architect, but there are forms, and you can see the classical forms, can't you? Uh, so the, the great dome of St Paul's Cathedral, you've got all this very Roman and Greco-Roman sort of hearkening back to. And then you've got refined and aesthetic sort of looks. So you've, you've got, for instance, the Georgian period buildings, um, and you've got the way some of the later landowners built their you think of Highclere Castle from Downton, okay? It's still got the classical impact and there's an aesthetic about it and there's ornamentation about it. But these are things that are expected. What's going on is a change in disposition, in a way of seeing the world, a desire to break away from the past and hopefully progress to a different future. This is one of the things, there is a contradiction in modernism. In the modernist movement, there is a sense of optimism, a sense of let's change the world order. There's a certain utopian look to the future. Um, a lot of that socially based as well, particularly as focus on the poor and elevating their position, as you'll see in architecture. Um, I, oddly enough, sort of an oxymoron, modernist work can also be highly pessimistic. There's a certain bleakness in it especially in the realm of literature, and we'll come to that in a minute. But talking about architecture and the way it breaks from classical form, it starts becoming less about ornamentation as about utility, about function, but not in one fell swoop. But there is a, a desire to turn away. You still want things to look beautiful, but there's a desire to turn away from being grasped by the past, all the old institutions, even of academia, it's the old way. So religion is going out. And you know, the monarchy in Britain, for instance, doesn't have anywhere near as much power as it once had. So in architecture, one of the things that you can see in the modernist movement, and some would argue this is not exactly modernist, but it falls within its remit as a subset, is Art Deco. Art Deco is a great movement in because think of have you ever seen an Art Deco building? Okay, you notice how it it's still ornamented, but you wouldn't call it highly ornamentational. It follows sort of edges, 
okay, a certain geometry begins to come in with Art Deco. As opposed to graceful curves, you've got hard geometric shapes appearing. In modernism, you'll get a lot of this. Think of cubism in art, geometric shapes. This is coming into architecture too, as well, but look at Art Deco. These geometric lines, this breaking away from form, this lack of ornamentation, this looking to the future. If I said Art Deco, you would never think 19th century. There's almost, with architecture, a definitive split. You've got the Edwardian designs, but they're still on classical form, and then suddenly, bang, you've got Art Deco and Art Nouveau, and it begins to develop out from there. And it moves on to what we would call sort of the the highly modern buildings, which are really about functionality. It's function over form, okay? It needs to be practical. And you start getting a reduction of colour as well, white. You think of Picasso's Guernica, black and white. The palette on modern buildings, if you think of modernism, most people will think of like minimalism, which is whiteness, okay, and basic. And one of the things that architecture focuses on is the materials themselves, not necessarily how it's all put together. So you'll start getting concrete, steel, glass. These things are all typical of modernism. It's a new world. These are new materials. It's time to move away from history and the classical way of doing things. And then you see, I mean, this, this stretches on way beyond like the Second World War. Um, you go back to a town like Coventry that was blown to bits in the Second World War. If you were to go there now, you would probably think it uh, used to be a relatively ugly city because it was built in a very modernist style. Square windows, all concrete, hard angular edges, functional. And you think of a lot of blocks of flats, functional. Um, one of the most influential architects is uh, Le Corbusier and you look at his works and you, you can immediately see modernism. It doesn't take a genius. You would look at it and go, oh, that's a modern house. Because you've got these angular shapes, there's a stripping away of ornamentation, there's a focus on the contrast of materials, and sometimes very odd shapes, which don't seem to fit with the classical idea. But also, one of the things Corbusier was interested in is elevating the standards of the poor. So providing homes which were good for them, but functional. You think of your typical block of flats, flat with windows, that's it. That's, that's modernism. And then that passes over into literature as well. And that's what we're going to come on to next. And you're going to find this bit fascinating. So literature is one of the main branches of grand art and expression and all that kind of stuff, exploration of the human spirit. It used to be quite representational. You know, you think of the, the idyllic countryside, the very bucolic kind of stories set out there and pastoral and um, didactic, sort of trying to teach moral lessons about how life should work. It's got all of that, but it too moves towards the modernist period. And realism sort of comes before your modernism, but it slides into it. Again, remember, in a movement, you can't just say, this is realism, this is modernism, because modernism will have elements of being realistic. In fact, very, very much so. It was the outcrop of realism and developed into this broader movement that had a different way of seeing the world because of the way things were changing. So, going back to the 19th century, realist authors, um, the granddad of realism, Flaubert, so Madame Bovary, and then you've got sentimental education and other stuff. But Flaubert, he starts focusing on very mundane stuff. So Madame Bovary is a very mundane novel. You've got a woman who's addicted to old romantic stories, she gets married, and then he's just bored, bored out of her mind. Her husband's boring, there's no romance like in the novels, there's no adventure, it's just day-to-day -day life. And she gets, obviously, into a bit of a pickle, won't say anything in case you haven't read it. But it's realism. This is different. Um, it, it would have not been received well by a lot of the public because it didn't have some moral message. It didn't necessarily represent a social change. It didn't give them some voyeuristic view into aristocratic life, you know, the Silver Fork novel kind of thing. 
But nonetheless, it was a movement of art because now that people are collecting in the cities even more, watching people, seeing the plight of people, the interconnectivity of people, becomes something that artists want to represent, okay? And so they start, instead of just giving the classical forms of your myth, you know, your legends, your folklores and your didactic teaching of morals, you start just, this is life. It becomes almost impressionistic in certain ways and very expressionistic in others. But there's, there's sort of where you start. Now, over in Britain, someone that's writing is Thomas Hardy. This is Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Again, a realist piece of work. He's picked a low girl and he's making a defense of those who are seduced to a women who are then outcast to society in the way they must feel inside. And very interesting. I've got a whole review on this in one of my videos, so I won't say too much here. But again, realism, looking at the lower orders, looking at ordinary life, looking at troubles and strife and questioning. In this book, there is a little, there's not just a little, there is a questioning of the role of the church in society, how it's not always for good. It can often suppress people. It can often be very judgmental of people. It often, to Thomas Hardy, you can tell in his writings, a lot of the answers the church give for the question of suffering, which is what Hardy is all about, seem to make no sense to him. And he wants to let go of the old traditions of the past and move towards a more utopian future. Interestingly, he, he was a humanist, but you can tell he was discontent even with that. And when World War I broke out, Thomas Hardy basically said that the Western powers should give, give up power in the world and let some other civilization have a go because he was completely distraught with what happened in World War I that they, with, for all their technological increase and their high sounding philosophies of how to govern, it was a disaster. They clearly couldn't do it. But that was realism. You can see this progression moving towards modernism. So modernism starts coming in and works that you're, oh, you have you have Zola in France. So Zola, again, he looks at the, the poor, you know, and he gets very gritty. So, you know, look at Germinal, his, his most famous work. He goes from realism to what's called sort of a subset of realism, it's, it's naturalism. Um, and that's very explicitly, humans only. Humans having to resolve everything. No call to the divine. Um, but also it stabs away at lots of the big institutions, especially the church, but a lot of the big institutions, you know, he lives in a, a, a country where you had the revolt of the Republic, okay, in the 1792 onwards. And then there was another revolution, of course, in, 70, uh, in, in 1830. Um, and then there was another one. So, France was trying to grow and still the institutions were a problem. They were trying to change. Zola picks up on this, okay? And again, we've got an, a sort of another turning of the realist movement. You see how movements build across, culture moves, movements come out of it. Then we get into the more specifics of your modernist movement. So in poetry, the classic um, modernist poet, was T.S. Eliot, or poem, it's T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Now, remember what modernism does, it casts off old form. It starts experimenting with techniques. It casts off history and wants to focus on the now. It wants to get rid of looking at the idealized life and looking at the ordinary life. It wants to really express what's going on in the human mind, just like the Impressionists did. They started showing you images of what your eye actually sort of sees, um, the impression of an idea. They've got more movement in those works. Um, there's, a, there's, an emotional, there's an emotional recognition for a lot of these works, if you look at them long enough. And this is what happens with literature, but literature has a bit more of a pessimistic outlook. We'll come to that in a minute. In Eliot's Wasteland, one of the things you've got is this multitude of voices and a constantly moving backdrop. And one of the things that Eliot draws on himself is his own problem with mental illness, traumatised mind. 
Um, Salvador Dali was interested in this too. He was fascinated with hallucination. Again, so the experience of the mind. It's not all linear, the mind. It's not as logical as the Renaissance says. Remember, back in the 18th century, Romanticism was a kick against Renaissance, but then after Romanticism, you get back into utilitarianism. In other words, the right way to do things, measure everything, scientifically weigh everything. It may have produced good things in science, but not in the societal world, because humans can't be measured like that. So there's a kick against that. And these techniques sort of get explored quite a lot. And you have some dramatic explorations. And there's a real urge to break up the forms of literature. You get erratic literature. You get multiple narrators. You get the, what's the, what's the phrase, the unreliable narrator. I'll give you an example of a great piece of what you would call early modernist work is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Try and read that book. It breaks a lot of your forms. You find yourself struggling to sort of follow it. It's, it's not even episodic. It's, it's the, the way the author sort of jumps here and there. And it's one of the authors from previous books, actually, Marlowe. And the talking about Kurtz, this enigmatic character, and knowing what truth is. There's a dispassionateness, there's an isolation, another element, particularly in literature, of modernism. Isolation. Um, the city has become so big that you are now a cog in the machine rather than an individual. Think of the old villages, everyone knew each other, and you could get your typical characters, okay? Um, so the Vicar of Wakefield back in the 18th century, all the characters have got their characteristics. They know each other. Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell, set in the village of Cranford. And everyone knows each other, but in the big city, people are getting lost. And so there's this sense of isolation, meaninglessness, pessimism. And you start finding that in the literature. So some of the books... Um, and that's why I say there's, there's pessimism in the heart of darkness. Um, everything is hemmed in by this jungle. It's almost like, I don't think it's an allegory of the city at all, but it's sort of anti-colonialist. Um, there's sort of, Comrade really does highlight the grotesqueness of what had been going on in Africa. But there's a dispassionate way, the way he finds people who are slaves who are just dying in a bush. And yet there's no drama about it. Odd it is, and this is experimenting with styles of writing. And Conrad, modern, ma makes realist and modern literature, but he's right at the forefront of modernism. But it moves on. Probably the most famous book, modernist book, Ulysses by James Joyce. The whole thing, look at the size of it, the whole thing happens in a day. The whole array of different characters giving us different ideas, different voices. It's all sort of a cacophonic, a cacophony of, of things going on. It's bewildering. It's labyrinthine. There's stream of consciousness again. Now, this is great. This is very part of the modernist movement. Stream of consciousness. Our thoughts aren't all joined. They are very random at times. We can be thinking one thing and suddenly switch off and move to something else. We are interrupted by another character. We're interrupted by events. Um, and then we come back to an idea we've been thinking on. You get that in James Joyce's works. Um, and so, you know, some call it the best book ever. I found it extremely difficult and I need to read it again because I didn't understand all of it. And yet what's great is he's taking an old, old gr Greek um, story and reinterpreting it in a totally new area. He's putting it in the modern world and condensing it as well. The epics of Greece go on for years, don't they? Um, like To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. She does in 10 days what Odysseus does in 10 years. And that was the whole idea, her response to Odysseus. So that's what modernism is doing. Another example is Mrs. Dalloway. Now, this is a thin book. If you want to get an idea of a stream of consciousness, I highly recommend this book. I thoroughly enjoyed this. You know, you've got Mrs. Dalloway. She's a very bored um, wife of an MP. She throws parties and soirees. And this takes place in one day as well. And what you've got is she's trying to set up this party, but she's so bored. And across town, unrelated to her, is a guy called Septimus Warren, 
who's come back from World War I with shell shock, and he's mentally breaking down. The passages with him are really interesting. The disjointedness of thoughts and ideas are interesting. The biggest thing that influences modernism, if you want to, I mean, some could argue with this, but the greatest impact in society, of course, was World War I. So, goodbye to all that, okay? Goodbye to all that, Robert Graves gives his memoir, and he's got his memoir of his early days, his childhood, and again, there's a certain depressingness about this, and the way pff, things don't go well, and institutions that are oppressive, and oppressive rules and laws. Ian Forster would talk about a lot of this. Um, in, our, in my Patreon, we recently um, read the book, A Room with a View, and you can see his feeling of the repressive standards and mores of Edwardian society. World War I comes along, and my days, you know, the institutions that were supposed to be so grand, they cause a war. People, millions of people die for an elite few. The religions of the world bless the troops on both sides to kill each other. There's a load of nonsensicalness. In 1914, the English and the Germans climbed out the trenches to have a game of football in no man's land, and then shook hands and went back to their trenches and the next day started killing each other en masse. It broke belief in the old way of doing things, and it spawns, in music for instance, the Jazz Age. And then you've got Stravinsky, you know, listen to some of his works, talk about someone trying to break, tech, break the classical forms of music. Robert Graves describes events in the First World War trenches, harrowing stuff. Ernst Young, Storm of Steel is another one. Um, so yeah, this is what's going on, and it's destroyed people's idea of the past. In literature, it breeds a pessimism. One of the characters, or authors, I particularly like for modernism, F. Scott Fitzgerald. So here we have the great Gatsby. One of the parts of modernism is, uh, there's a movement towards quite a bit of symbolism, but you've got to be careful with symbolism. You can find symbols where there are none. Um, so it's... <laughs> But modernists were experimenting with symbolism and metaphor quite a lot. Gatsby does that. Now, Gatsby comes off the back of the, second, of the First World War. And there's, this, there's also this overarching New York, which whenever they go into New York, it's dominating, but it's brown and it's dusty and it's bleak, and nothing good happens in those parts of the stories. You know, there's drunkenness, there's fights, there's um, a bit of domestic abuse. And so... You know, it's bleak. The city is bleak. But in there, there's this advertising. It's a doctor. I can't remember what, what it's selling. But all it is is a pair of spectacle glasses looking down. What does it represent? Is it, is it our life's under a microscope? Is it God? Is it the state? What, what is it? It's a symbol of something. And it gives you an eerie feeling because it keeps turning up. And it's no accident because... Fitzgerald wouldn't keep mentioning it if it wasn't to convey something, but you're left to work out what that is. Speaking of Fitzgerald, his next book after Gatsby is Tender is the Night. What a great book, by the way. I'm definitely going to do a full deep review on this. There's a certain bewilderingness about how it's laid out. It was not well received in its day. People were excited because Gatsby was a success, and then this. And you have a very serious discussion about mental illness, institutions, okay? There is also infidelity in here, which for its day must have been quite shocking. You know, it's not graphic, but you have the account of them sort of embracing each other, kissing each other, falling onto a bed. It doesn't go any further than that, but it still lets you know how these ones feel, and yet one of them is married, so we've got adultery. Now, that is a break from the past. It, it doesn't necessarily say it agrees with it, but it's exploring what things are like. And the main character in here, Dick Diver, his name is, um, what a troubled life. What a sense of isolation, because this man is so good at cheering other people up. But the sense of isolation that he feels, the trappedness of it all, the meaninglessness of everything for nearly all the characters. Alcoholism is in here. It's 
it's fascinating to read, but also the way it's read, uh, writ, written, it keeps jumping around um, in places, and, and characters walk in, and there's no introduction. So classical literature, uh, when I say that, I don't mean antiquity, 19th century literature, your, your ordinary story, if someone is going to walk into the scene, the author will at least give you a bit about them. In comes Mr. Jones, and he has red hair and spectacles and has a funny way of speaking. He can't say the letter S, and we get that, and he comes from X. Now we have it. In here, our character just starts talking about other people who you've never heard of before. And you stop and you go back and you think, have, have I missed who that person is? Or someone else will just walk in and start talking. And you're like, who's this? They're not introduced. And it's midway through a conversation that your characters are having. And so it's, it's completely disruptive. It's real life, though. What's happening is it's expressive. Rather than trying to paint a distinct pastiche, uh, 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 a distinct moment that's well mapped out. There's a, there's a discordantness in certain places. And the book's fabulous. So, looking at those... Can you see what modernism is? The, the arts express it. You'll find it in other areas as well, like music, which I haven't really gone into. I don't know so much about that. But you see how it's reflecting a culture. You start to see how to define modernism. You can see it is breaking the norms. You can see it wants to leave the past and explore a new idea. Whether that's progressive or it's exploring the world we are in now is broken. And what's the point? Lit modernist literature, there's a lot of bleak sort of, you know, life is meaningless. So the flappers came out of that, you know, the jazz age, where it was just throw caution to the wind and just enjoy yourself. Somerset Maugham is around this time with, with works like The Painted Veil, which we'll also be doing in my Patreon later in the year. So do you see what modernism is? A break from the past, breaking norms, getting rid of certain frills and ornamentation, learning to express what life is, what it means to exist, an expression of consciousness. So not just the story, but from within, perceiving what the world is. And also a focus on modernity, hence modernism. You know, we've changed, the world is industrialised. And of course, that picks up at a rapid rate. And so when you get into... The 20s, far more industrialised than we were in the 1890s. And then you've got other elements like prohibitionism in the United States and the effect that that has on people. All of this becomes the modernist movement and then we'll reach out to postmodernism, which is a bit of a, a, a knee-jerk reflex, which always happens in art. If ever we found humans made a perfect system you would get a certain stasis then. But the fact that these movements change is because as time goes by, the modernists were optimistic in changing maybe, but it didn't fully work. And so new movements come in. There's always a challenge of the old guard, but this one was particularly big. And you see, it's a good example of how movements sort of gradually appear. It works. So how did you enjoy this video? Did you get through all of it? Did you enjoy it? And um, if you did, please feel free to share it on... If you're on Facebook and you're in any literature groups, um, please feel free to share this video for others to watch. Leave your comments down below, and until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.